oh, I have to go and rescue my child. The child will never learn anything. And I would love to segue from here into letting the baby sleep outside. When you have a child, don't be OCD. This is something I would really, really, really vet. Have your baby and then start buying the stuff because you're going to see what you actually need. How do you deal with dogs or pets and children? If you need a babysitter, I recommend not to use your dog to babysit your baby. But talking about screen time, what is an appropriate age to introduce children to cartoons? Why do you introduce them for the cartoons? I don't even want to think about it. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the Homesome Podcast. And today we have a really good one for you. We just finished six hours of uh, baby training, but okay, what is baby training? Okay, I learned CPR on a baby, first aid for babies. Uh, I learned about breast pumps. Uh, I needed to know a lot about breast pumps. And we also learned about uh, how to massage a baby and everything else uh, new parents should know. And today with us in the studio, we have an expert, Kadi, who taught all of these things for us. To frame everything to the listener and the viewer, tell us, how did you get started? How did you come to start the community, Kadi and Babies, and what got you interested in everything related to babies? It's actually started nearly 11 years ago. I'm actually commercial economic background. I moved to UK, my English was basically zero. And the best way to learn the language is start with the children. So I start working with the children, being a nanny. And I find out there is a market for the maternity nurses. So I did the courses. I, then I find breastfeeding, baby massage. I find all this related with the families and babies to educate myself and um, share my knowledge for the families, what I've been now doing in yeah, nearly 11 years. So your role, you, you would describe yourself as a maternity nurse? Yes. So what is a maternity nurse and what does a maternity nurse do? So in my area, maternity nurse has no medical background, but I support the families from the birth of the baby. And or even I, before, as we saw today, for six hours. <laughs> yes, before. And six hours was really squeezed everything in. Yeah. So I think one thing I will say about myself, what I don't do. So I don't breastfeed and I don't give the birth, but I do rest of it. Whatever related for the families and babies. And w because this is my first time, obviously this is my first time also having a baby. Yeah. But this is my first time hearing about uh, a maternity nurse. So is that a common thing in the UK or in Estonia? I haven't noticed it, but in the UK and US, how common is having a maternity nurse? How common is parents getting this pre-training in raising babies? I'm a luxury. Let's say this way. It's not common. People who have money. I'm a luxury to, to have me around 40, 24 hour. It's... Some families will say they just want me for a night. Some people will say we want 24 seven. They decided or they realized they are not really baby person or family. They have to go back to work. So then they have me to oh. support and help with a baby, everything with a baby related stuff. Okay, so your role is like, a, let's say a family hires you and you work with the family then full time. But how long usually do people work with maternity nurses? Depends. It's uh, for me, it's been going like uh, from like few months until years because okay. they're going to have a second one and third one. Okay. So <laughs> all depends, all depends what is the needs for the family and what is the budget. When we're talking about new parents, like we're going to be new parents, expecting our baby in the coming months. What are the some of the things that new parents should know, should deal with, but the majority of them, as you see in your line of work, that they don't know or people don't realize? Because there were quite a lot of those like really surprising things that even to me that I thought that were, that I knew how to do or what they wear. And uh, as I discovered today, it's not that straightforward. Yeah. So maybe let, so, let's let's name some like few overarching areas and then let's zoom into them one by one. Yeah. So if you ask one things, I recommend really highly lower your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> lower your expectations. Don't expect your your baby gonna gonna be sleeping through the nights. Your breastfeeding journey gonna be just flowers and uh, like 
having a fairy tale, it's not. You can have really great journey, no issues, but be ready. Today we was talking about lots of things when breastfeeding doesn't work and why it doesn't work. You see all the my luggage was full of equipment. Yeah, so you brought like a lot of stuff, a lot of bottles. I was just like looking at everything. I was like, oh my goodness, like <laughs> different bottles, <laughs> different, different bumps, bottles, yeah, yeah, like exactly. all kinds of things. It's it's really what I recommend highly. Have the really good people around you. Find the support. Don't concentrate for the things like mm -hmm. oh which kind of bed I gonna have is it that's the buggy I really want you gonna probably order the buggy what cost with all those lights and uh, I don't know whatever added to with this all the bells and whistles exactly yeah. exactly and you're gonna pay a uh, lots of thousands of uh, euros pounds but I recommend educate yourself first yeah what I really liked is that well, I was waiting and it was really hard to actually wait and not go out and buy everything before we met in person and before we had the workshop, because obviously I already went, my mom was visiting. So we went to buy, um, you know, just like some basic stuff like towels and stuff like that. But I was like with the bottles and all that, I'm just going to wait because I want to talk to you in person. And I'm really glad that I did because, you know, at home some we're also about like sustainability and environment and all that and as you pointed out is that people go crazy they buy a lot of things before the baby is even born like countless number of bottles same bottle because it was on sale or for whatever reason somebody said it was good and that it actually doesn't work for you and your baby like if you have to bottle feed right or want to um, the same thing with diapers you mentioned right so can we just like go into that a little bit of like what people should be aware of what is just like marketing and what you actually need so if you give the baby for me straight away uh, I don't need anything I will because I don't do breastfeeding I will just go and get basic uh, formula and bottle because obviously I don't have the baby but if someone's gonna give me the baby and for me it will be like little bag of nappies I don't buy a lots of nappies like let's say you're expecting your baby and people go and start buying like from the day one they find out they are pregnant oh I'm gonna buy the nappies because it's on sale it's cheap but end of it, you're going to have your baby and comes out, your baby going to have a nappy rush, going to have some allergic reaction. Tell me what you're going to do with those nappies. Mm -hmm. Storage full of basically like... Yes, so I don't nappies. recommend to buy things because it's on sale, because someone said you need. You don't know the situation you guys have. Like, do you need any bottles? Which kind of breast uh, pump you need? Like today we had a couple of different ones. Some needs more like a handwork. Uh, some was, yeah, was uh, the, the, <laughs> the suction was like, it's going to suck your brain yeah. out of it. The suction is really good. And how to find out what is exactly for you, the right things. But we can't find out this before you have your baby. Have your baby and then start buying the stuff because you're going to see what you actually need. Mm -hmm. So it should be basically the mom has the baby and then the dad has to be prepared to go out and buy stuff run shopping yes yeah. like shop if if necessary right because it's like difficult for the new mom to to go out or have someone to to buy it for yes, you. yes but you can have basic things ready at home let's say you're gonna have some clothes ready or this kind yeah. of things but don't buy the things you don't know is it gonna actually fit mm -hmm. with your your family and your babies like i find probably i like this a really good uh, buggy I can go for a run I say this big wheel is amazing but you don't like even to go out for a walk you're gonna put the buggy on, on the terrace and that's it why do you need the running buggy which costs like thousands of euros there is no point for you to buy this if you don't use it mm -hmm. so always think who gonna use and which kind of products and then make your decision don't buy the stuff because someone said buy it but mm -hmm. what you're saying is what we were talking about before the co before this conversation as well is this recommendation not to buy things not to purchase too many items that you might not need has a different angle to it as well because you're saying is we should focus or reinvest some of the money what we save here to some other areas so what are the other areas new parents should focus on where they do want to invest the area that made me cry yes and uh, <laughs> There is a couple of things what I recommend. 
if you want to invest on something, go and do uh, trainings, have the first aid training. We find out today when I ask the questions about what is your knowledge about the CPR? I think I did, I did a course when I was like in primary school, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe high school. I don't remember everyone's, anything. Everyone's done some course at some point when they yeah. get driver's license, you know, yeah. it's mandatory. Yeah. But, but now my question is, it will be good to read you, read on the first aid for the babies mm-hmm. and the little children, because where the accidents happens with the children at home, is it your home is actually safe for the children? How many cables hanging? I saw the the bunch of wires on the side of the TV. You will not pass my uh, well, health and safety inspection. Just, I'm telling you, <laughs> we just moved in, so excuses. it's like it's still excuses. It's, it's, excuses. it's still being like organized and put away. But yeah, make sure your home is actually safe. Educate yourself, health and safety, safe sleeping. Can mm-hmm. you go sleep? What do you can have on your baby's got? So is this something they also talk about in uh, the baby first aid courses when you take one about co-sleeping? I don't think so. Mm. No, they don't talk about this. it's not first this. aid, right? It's yeah. not the first yeah. aid, but they will say don't sleep with your baby when you've been smoking, drinking, mm. all those. What? Yeah, mm-hmm. but going back to the first aid before jumping on the health and safety in general, with the first aid for babies, how does it differ from first aid to adults? Because there were a few principles that are different there that you mentioned. Yes, the one where I make you nearly to cry. And uh, don't worry, when I did first time my first aid training with the babies, I was like, I think everyone in the room was the same. So don't worry. So my question was, um, when you have the baby and you have to do the first, you have to make sure what you have to do with a baby. So what you're going to do first? Are you going to call the ambulance? Oh, you're going to start doing CPR. What are you going to do first? Yeah, we were like, I don't know, multitask, multitask. Like, yeah, I mean, just multi-ta- do like everything, everything at the same time. Because I know my phone is going to be in my range. So multitask was the correct answer. But I did, because uh, I, didn't, I didn't know which way you wanted me to go. But my logic was, I'm not going to let the baby suffocate. I'm going to first help the baby. It's, it doesn't make sense for me to go grab the phone and start calling the ambulance. I just first need to deal with the baby. But what was actually surprising to me, which turned out to be the correct answer in that sense, but I was saying also multitask, I'm going to dial the phone and help the baby and dial the phone at the same time, I'm going to do two two things at once. But what also surprised me is what you said, that for the adults, it's different, that you first need to... So if we talk about the first, uh, we talk about the CPR Mm -hmm. with the babies, first you help the baby and then you call the ambulance, You you do CPR one minute. And with the adults, first you call the ambulance and then you help the adult. And the reason is because the baby's brain run out of the oxygen really quickly when same time the adults has enough oxygen in the body. So you can call the ambulance. There For is a longer nothing. time, right? Yes. Yeah. And mm-hmm. isn't this something I can just learn on YouTube, watch a few videos and know how to do it? Oh, I like the doctor YouTube and Google. There are, those are the best. Those are so good. I don't recommend them to anyone. Yeah. So and it's, it's so also- my answer is no. I don't recommend uh, learning all kinds of what is actually need knowledge and practice face to face learning in YouTube. It's the same like in COVID lockdowns. Everyone start finding they can uh, be a hairdresser by YouTube. So <laughs> I remember it, it's it's oh, same things with the hair. You know, hopefully the hair gonna grow back if you did a really bad haircut but if you did a cpr learning by the youtube i'm not sure if this person really gonna survive after your first aid training and who was the person actually was teaching you because i just show you the one little part of it the first aid training and just with this one doll but first aid training is something much more Mm -hmm. than just the cpr doll so and one of the other things was um, what I, what was surprising to me, you know, I had this like picture of the beautifully decorated cot and having having like those side uh, uh, like a protector so that the baby actually doesn't hit um, hit themselves. Right. Um, but you told me that they're actually not safe. So what is it that can actually be in the cot or in the bed where the baby sleeps and what cannot so my really short answer for this is 
don't have anything in the cut what shouldn't be there in originally. Mm-hmm. If you have the beddings, make sure the beddings actually the bed sheet uh, fit under the mattress properly. If it's not with the elastic, what will go under it and and don't put anything low. No toys, no those soft head um, bumpers, whatever they have in the cots, nothing because that increase the temperature in the cot and uh, that's will end. It's gonna end up really sadly. And the lost the baby. Yeah, there's no air flow. There is no in, right? air flow. So, yeah. That the temperature's gonna get really high in the bed, and that's by law in US and UK. You shouldn't have any of those mm-hmm. things in the bed. So if I go to the families, I do the visit at home. We're gonna set up the nursery. We're gonna see like what they need, what they have, or I go to my clients. Being mm-hmm. a maternity nurse, I see all kinds of things being in the cot. So there is actually no space for the baby. I will take, I take always those things out. And I say, when I go, you want to keep those, but not with me. And if something happened, I don't think you want to just play with your child life or health and safety in this point. Yeah. So I will really recommend to do the research and see what is the safe sleeping for the baby. And you also mentioned that there shouldn't be any blankets. Yes. And extra things, why is that? It's really simple. If you have the blanket in a bed, it's easy for the baby to just kick this over the head. And suffocate. Yes. Basically. And what about the baby's sleeping position? Because you also mentioned that the baby should always sleep on its back, not on the side or the tummy. Yes, exactly. So the health and safety again coming here. It's uh, the safest way to put the baby to sleep is on the back when someone said, oh, but uh, when he's going to vomit or any other things, the baby will turn the head and there is no issue. If you put the baby on the side, it's easy to fall on the belly and... But if there's no blanket, then how can you cover the baby? How can you keep the baby warm? My really highly recommended uh, items are sleeping bags. You have to find the right size and make sure it's not too thick for the baby so the baby will will not like overheat. So find the right size, right? So the baby also doesn't go into, go and disappear inside the sleeping bag. That means it's too big. Mm -hmm. That's also not safe. Yeah, I also had like, uh, I was telling you that um, I had an issue because I was was thinking that the baby is going to be cold if I don't put the blanket over, right? But um, the sleeping bags that are organic cotton that I found, they're very thin. But then you looked at it and you said that it might actually be enough because the ones that are thicker, they have a polyester inside and we want to avoid polyester. Yes, but so, also if you look your room temperature, yeah. I recommend to have a lower bedroom temperature because the baby body doesn't have the regulation of the, the body temperature. So if it's a little bit cooler, the baby body will go, the temperature will go up. But if it's too hot, baby can't cool down by themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's the same for adults because it's recommended to sleep in a colder bedroom for deeper and better sleep. It's like 19 degrees uh, Celsius. Yeah. I don't know how much it, that is in Fahrenheit. And I would love to like segue from here into like letting the baby sleep outside because I'm like really excited about this. And this is also health and safety, right? Because yeah, it's mean, like yeah. we know that in the in the US, like I, you know, it's like people uh, usually are almost scared of leaving the baby out on the, on the, in the cold. Your, your Whereas, parenting rights are going to be taken away. The baby is going to be taken yes, away if you leave the baby probably. outside. Here in Estonia, it's very normal. It's very normal to take the baby and put them to sleep outside, even if it's November, December, and the temperatures are really low, like... Minus Celsius. I need the Fahrenheit to demonstrate it to our yeah. uh, US viewers. It's probably maybe like 10 Fahrenheit or something like that. Yeah. Maybe. So it's like even at minus 20 degrees, you can put the baby out to sleep, right? Of course. I don't see any reason why you should, but why should you shouldn't? Tell yeah. me one good reason. Cold. That's what people are afraid I of. I didn't ask to put the baby without clothes. <laughs> you you put the right like sleeping bag. You're going to dress the baby right. Depends of the temperature. You're going to check the baby. You, it's not just you're going to leave the baby outside and you go, okay, two hours, see you then. You don't do this. So you're going to always keep the eye on the baby. You, you put the monitor into the buggy so you know exactly what's happening. Go and have a look. 
So I don't recommend like when you have the baby, put it sleeping outside and then you're like, okay, time at three hours, see you then. Don't do this. So but what is the purpose of letting the baby sleep, letting babies sleep outside in the cold? Fresh air. It doesn't matter if it's cold or, or a little bit warmer. The main thing is babies who sleep outside, they have a better quality of the sleep and the reason because of the fresh air. It's also immunity, I believe, that if it's like if they're put outside in the cold, their immunity um, is stronger. I mean, that's, that's true for all adults. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 exactly. Fresh air. I, mean, I will say fresh air is like a truck for the babies. <laughs> yeah. If your baby doesn't sleep indoor, take for a walk, put on the terrace, the buggy and have a look how the sleeping habits develops change, and how yeah. they change. Mm-hmm. So because even for us, you know, if you if you Miriam and I we spend a nice day outside uh, the whole day, let's say in the sun or even during cold. When you come back in the evening and you go to sleep, you're going to get a really good night of sleep because you spent the entire day outside. So, I mean, that's only going to hold more true for the babies if they sleep outside. So it makes sense. So like all of it makes sense. So all the things what you like, actually, your baby will like as well. Mm -hmm. I always think the things you do for your baby, think this way. Do you like someone to do it for you? Or not. Yeah. Like. And I guess the one angle why people uh, in other, let's say, cult- I can't say cultures, but other countries are so afraid of leaving babies outside is because in, let's say, those countries, you have more of a danger of people stealing, stealing your baby or doing something to your baby, which isn't, it's really could not a be. concern here. Yeah. I mean, it could be a very, very rare occurrence, but I haven't heard yeah, anything I've happening seen, to anyone here i've seen babies literally left like on the street outside here and yeah, but i mean yeah. you should you shouldn't be negligent of course you should always keep an eye on the baby and know that everything's safe but it's in uk i can say why people don't leave the child alone to sleep outside and always you sit next to the baby the one reason is because of the foxes so the fox oh. will go and jump into the buggy and they okay. can harm your baby oh that's so there's a lot of is it, there, it's, there is in London? More, oh in London there is a lot yes. of foxes oh everywhere even there my is, sister's apartment uh, yeah. which is like in the middle of the city would have foxes oh yeah yeah, yeah. so oh. yeah that's that's one of the thing it's just the animals who can just jump to the buggy make feel cozy or or harm your baby <laughs> It's nice and yeah. cozy next to this little yeah. one who is nicely wrapped. And if I'm going to have the opportunity to jump there and feel nice and... I never thought Sounds of that, Sounds like actually. a Disney movie. Yeah. So continuing on the, on the health and safety uh, angle, it's we addressed having clean cots, like not, not clean, but having uh, cots free from uh, clutter. You also mentioned about our wirings, so we have to keep clean out our wires and every little thing that baby grab uh, can grab onto and move around or stick his fingers into. Um, and we also touched on the mattress because our crib and our mattress that we we basically inherited from our friends, which is a non-toxic, high quality, uh, this coconut mattress. But you mentioned that using other people's mattresses is not a good idea. So why is that? So I explained about when people ask, what is the things you could get secondhand? I'm really into this, like reusing stuff, having a secondhand baby clothes. One things what I always recommend, get the new mattress. And the reason, because you don't know how this mattress been used. Is this mattress been always have the protector on? When, uh, when this child been growing out of the crib, where this mattress actually been keep it do they have any animals who've been having access to this mattress like all the things like is it the baby been throwing up being sick Mm -hmm. and uh, you say yeah the germs and and when we had a chat about the you said oh you know we know our friends and then i ask okay do you buy a second hand uh, mattress do you want someone else one even your friends ones and what was your answer no not really sounds icky so why do you want your baby gonna have someone secondhand mattress? Yeah. Yeah, because I guess it's like in my head it was only used for like nine or ten months, 
um, in that particular cut because it's also the cut is vintage, so it doesn't it doesn't have the functionalities of a modern modern one where you could like lower it so that the baby can be in there even when they stand up, right? So it's it serves its purpose for a couple of months. So that was my thinking that it was like used for such a short time, and you know it's like why do I want to buy a new mattress? But that's really but, that's yeah. really you are the parent. You're gonna make a decision. Yeah. Which, I which just kind didn't of think about it. You, but I think yeah. that's one of the things you don't think. Yeah. And when I come and people ask, so what I should get? And for me, have you can have basically everything on second hand mattress. Get the new mattress. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you also touched on animals here. So how do how should we introduce babies and animals? Because we have a pet, a furry friend. I don't know where he is. You, sleeping you had. There. <laughs> we we <laughs> have this furry friend here. Uh, so how? do you deal with dogs or pets and children and how should I perhaps like frame it in my head how much access should the dog have with the baby how much should I restrict the dog getting like uh, in contact with the baby or what should my thinking around this be so the main things when people having a baby the pet who been always like first things in their life really often people don't go anymore the morning walks they don't give any attention for this poor animal so the thing is the the pet will feel really left out and I recommend do exactly the same things what you did before the baby been born you have your own morning walks you take to the seaside go to the forest walk don't stop doing those things what you did with your pet because you have a child so I think it's really important to make sure the dog doesn't feel left Neglected on the side almost, and, and yeah. the, in the way like it's have to get the attention how you're gonna get that attention okay i'm gonna be in the corner i'm gonna that's what happened nibble to your our, shoes yeah that's what happened to our friends like uh their dog actually peed on the bed a couple of times after they had the baby she also had something that's called a phantom pregnancy so she was it phantom or pseudo no ph- phantom Both. phantom yeah both of them basically so phantom pregnancy so she would like hoard she would take a toy and they should like take care of the toy she would produce milk which was freaky for them she's like you never never had puppies and then all of a sudden she's like producing producing milk so so i they can get- i i think it's the best what you can do to um do some researches is there is anyone who actually can come to your home talk through the things how your pet can get used to with a baby and make sure it's going to be really smooth Mm -hmm. and also when when you have children to make sure you tell to your children like that's like this is the dog bed you don't go there you don't touch the dog when the cat or dog goes because often people will have like you have the dog but your friends coming with the children who will go and just grab the dog and go and run after the the dog to the dog bed but it should be a safe place so make sure the dog still, if he decided not to have any contact with a baby or children, he's going to go to his bed or his area and it will be child free. And these boundaries should also be set up with your own children and your own family. Yes, mm-hmm. for sure. And how much contact can a dog have with a baby? Or uh, is it like, because today when we brought out the baby dolls, the dog came over, started sniffing the dolls, everything, checked all the dolls. So if we're, for example, massaging the baby on the floor, I mean, I wouldn't want to, I would guess that the dog helps build, like growing up with a dog helps build your immune system, helps build the baby's immune system. But what, what is too much? What can the dog do and what cannot the dog do? Because we also talked about kissing the babies on the lips and how that can end up badly. I just want to say, like, I think for me, the line will be when the dog start licking the baby's mouth. I think mm. there is a line. Um, I will I will make sure there is some boundaries. Mm. But, but a lick on the forehead? I don't think this either. I think licking the baby by the dog, if it's avoidable, you know, things happen yeah. anyway. But uh, letting the dog to do in purpose, I will not. But mm-hmm. it's just me. Mm-hmm. So parenting style, everyone has a different parenting style and... Uh, that's that's really up to you so there's no like golden rule there that you should keep the dog away from the baby for x amount of time no okay because it's the dog is part of your family the baby comes to the family should get used to it what you have already like people asking me often like 
we're gonna have a baby do we have to get rid of our our cats and dogs someone say it somewhere or i read about you shouldn't have animals when you have babies like it doesn't make sense it mm. actually increases their immunity because yes. they're yeah they're exposed to like more germs and their immune system works on it and then and they're gonna have stronger immunity later in life yes so, so yeah, i yeah. recommend if you didn't have the dog before if you have a baby or before the baby is born get some bets yeah. but it's gonna be extra job so don't expect that's gonna be super easy don't take don't, don't do everything in the same time mm. yeah we have to get this one used to uh the changes somehow because ever since Miriam got pregnant the dog has been picking sides so he's been cuddling up to me more and listening to me more before he used to be like uh, more of Miriam's dog but now I guess he feels some change coming so he's way closer to me now so it's like a fun little shift there we need a psychologist for that a dog psychologist. <laughs> so is, is it feels like there is a competition I mean mm. between whom like you have the between the, the, the dog and the baby no, between you two. Between <laughs> yes. No, 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 no. That wasn't that wasn't a competition. I'm not boasting. That was Miriam's complaints that the dog is paying too much attention to me now. Yeah. Probably you take more walks with him. You do I'm, more I stuff. I have been lately. Yeah. Well, you do. Yeah. They have the, their morning ritual where they go. So, for and coffee. that's the things you shouldn't stop when you have yeah. the baby. Continue exactly the same things, and if you take the baby with you for the morning walks, that's amazing as well. Yeah, and I guess. Uh, it, added to the health and safety things i've also heard about cases uh, why you shouldn't leave the baby alone with an animal or a pet you should always keep an eye on one of them at least yes yes so it's like i i unfortunately i don't want to like resuscitate these things but i've heard uh, bad things happen when people have entrusted babies or like little children around their dogs and dogs who might get jealous so same example if you need a babysitter I recommend not to use your dog to babysit your yeah. baby. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we've, we've covered the cuts, wires, uh, mattresses, now animals. What else, what are some other areas from the health and safety perspective of children, of your home and everything of raising the babies that new parents should definitely pay attention to or get themselves up to speed with? I'm going to suggest a topic on this one, screen time, because that is really health and safety. And safe. if, in my opinion, that's like, you know, if you give your child like too much screen time, like you said that it's like the screen is the cheapest nanny, um, but it it does uh, pose some risk, right? So maybe we can talk about that. So I'll, what's your perspective on screen yeah. time? And First, uh, before we're going <laughs> to deep go and deep talk about the screen time, I recommend remove the screens from the parents. Let's start with this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Ba you also baby see, baby do. Yeah. And you also told me that, like, don't scroll your phone when you're breastfeeding, because if you see something upsetting on the phone, automatically, like your milk production can actually stop. It's going to so, slow down. It's going to yeah. stop. It's all about your emotions. Mm -hmm. And yeah. having a breastfeeding and phone, I don't recommend have yeah. a bunch of books might be a sad book though <laughs> read it's, something good yeah, yeah. yeah. but in in, in that angle because i heard you two talking about as well before we started recording that there are uh, ipad holders for babies that people put a screen in their baby's face right in the up strollers. The in the strollers right. yes so there is um you know the market if you want to be rich overnight I have the recommendation start with two businesses. One, what is um, go all the stuff for the babies, because people get crazy about the baby stuff. They buy everything, like Miriam, you say, do you want to buy like a bunch yeah. of things? You just but go to hold. the store, exactly, and you're just, like, everything is like so cute and like so yeah, and nicely they say you organized. Need, you need this, you, you can't this. just raise exactly. your child without yeah. those items. You have to have it. Yep. So you have to have this expensive nappy bean. <laughs> what you're gonna have the the bags for the nappy bean cost probably another 30 uh pound uh the one yeah what goes it, inside is exactly diaper this, genie right something like this yeah. some some kind of thing so you have specific bags mean to this bean only specific ones you pay a uh, lots of money but end of it i don't see the reason why you can't just uh, put on the normal Bean, what mm -hmm. you're gonna take out every day the nappy bean gonna stay weak sometimes longer until Ugh. it doesn't feel anything it's gross 
So you don't need this. I don't even want to think about it. Yes. Yeah, so it, let it your imagination always, to work and you can see you exactly, don't need this. Exactly. It's always like, I always thought about it and I was like, the bin is so big. I know that the baby uses a lot of nappies, but they kind of like fold really small, especially when the smallest number, right? Size. So it's like, how many of them can you actually fit into that bin? And how long do you have to wait until you empty the bin? It's like, it's disgusting. Sorry. No judgment those on those who are using But yes, <laughs> talking about this kind of things you, you can buy and the marketing. So coming back to the screens, mm -hmm. it is now the new market. Uh, it's to, you can have the screen holder for the buggy. I've been seeing this and uh, like, you know, I'm not a fan of screens. I'm well known in, uh, in UK and well known with my... I'm well known because I don't give any screens for the children. I raise the children without screen. I see there is a lot of things to do outdoor. If it's indoor, there is a lot of activities to do without screens. I also help the families who, who the parents are actually the screen addicted. So what we do in the front door, everyone who comes to the house, there is a little box, all the phones go there and nobody don't touch anything before the children are sleeping. After that, do whatever you want. It's not easy. And uh, mm -hmm. I've been giving the interviews and family, one of the family gave the interview for the TV channel saying it's not easy, but it's worth it. You're going to connect with your children. You're going to do the cooking with your children. You feel you have a lot of time, quality time, rather than just scrolling up and down, up and down. And for mm -hmm. you, if you do the breastfeeding, concentrate for the breastfeeding and for your baby, rather than seeing if there is a new pram or a new equipment you just need so, so desperately because you can't raise your child without it. But talking about screen time, what is an appropriate age, let's say, to introduce children to cartoons? Why do you introduce them for the cartoons? I mean, I would guess I'm not going to show them cartoons, but at some point you would want to show them cartoons. At Why? some point they're gonna, they want to see these things. No, no, they don't want, if they've been never seeing, they don't want to see. So, Why do you want to give the screen for your child? I really want to get this out of you. What, what is the interest to give the screen time for your child? One of the reasons Well, I want to watch cartoons. Exactly, but now we're getting there. It's not about the child, it's you, because you want to do the things. They yeah. don't know if they've been never had things like they've been never had the screen time. They're happily go and play outside. They will be muddy and enjoy yeah. the park and do the stuff. In your experience, what's the oldest child that you work with who hasn't been introduced to screens? Let's say this way, you can't really avoid those days, like keep the children away the screen because when they go to school and especially in mm. UK, they start showing the screens at school, but at home, as yeah. long as uh, I know the families, they're happy to be screen free. You have so much else to do. The children who've been not introduced earlier to the screen or they don't have this access at home, they will be good at school. They're going to read. They're going to improve their reading. Like I always said, I'm not the smartest cookie, but I can read fast so I can actually take uh, lots of information in. So if you if you are weak in one point, maybe you're, you are not able to um, catch everything really quickly, but you can read and your brain will work and train really well, you can do much more than sitting on the screen. So people will say, oh, but my child gonna have so many languages. Those days also the screen delays the speech and language for the children. Mm. And that's a really also common- also motor skills, right? Yes. Yeah. The one reason why I would think that, um, you know, that you could introduce a screen to the kids at some point is that when they go to school and their friends are talking about, you know, a cartoon, I don't know if that happens, but I just imagine it does. Uh, when they're talking about the cartoon or like a new series or something like that, and then the child, your child, like doesn't know anything about it, they would feel left out. But okay. I don't know if it's true. So then I have the question. <laughs> if your friend buys the Ferrari for, for the child, are you going to buy also because your child say, but I feel left it out? No. So, yeah, probably. You got a point. Yeah, but I would wonder it maybe, yeah, because my biggest worry was like, let's say the way I had it framed in my head, but now it's, I guess it's time to reframe it is also what you expressed right now is 
that the children are going to be lacking some sort of, um, let's say, an angle to the social skill or lacking some sort of like a cultural angle. You know, the classic trope of a homeschool child is like the in mo- many people's minds, if you homeschool a child, that they're going to be socially awkward and not be able to like relate or talk to other people. But in reality, as much as I've heard that socially, I'm sorry, that homeschooled children ha- are way more developed socially and are way more developed in like different areas and are so often more advanced in that sense. So it's like two sides of the thing. But it's it's like there is this trope and this trope co- does come from somewhere that these children who are homeschooled do lack some sort of, uh, often might end up lacking some sort of, uh, let's say, social skills. So I'm wondering if that has to do with the screen time or like watching cartoons or like growing up with some things as well, that they might be lacking something that's going to help them relate to the other children. I think here it's more like how much time and uh, what the parents do when they do homeschooling, Mm. how much time the children actually spend time with other children, like outside their home. Uh, I will say the children need to uh, have the social life and the skills like same example when someone said oh someone some child went and pushed my child and the playing in the sandbox someone pushed oh I have to go and rescue my child the child will never learn anything there is a question when you're gonna go and help the child if someone I gonna see someone is knocking out the little one then I will go and say something but until there is just a little bit like I don't know someone just take the shovel or the something something toy I let them to deal with it because that's the social skills they're gonna learn Mm -hmm. those days like when you go same example you go to the office helicopter parenting yeah helicopter parenting I don't recommend I don't go and uh, say anything until I don't see the blood let's say this way (laughs) So my point is, those like, are I, the social skills that count. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Until there is no blood, go for it. <laughs> yeah. No, no. But I think it's it's also you use your common sense. Like where is the line? I think it's uh, it's uh, lots of things. It's you should use your brain and think about like what you let your children to do and what not. So the thing is with the screen time in UK, the recommendation by the NHS is I think until like three or five years not to show but the truth is something else then it says like one hour screen time and all these things I can tell you you will like yes three years we don't show anything then it's just half an hour or show some cartoons the thing is also what do you show your child really yeah, often the children is just is let it to something I would really 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 vet because I do not trust YouTube kid stuff I've seen way too much what's going on there and I know how these things are produced and they're just money machines that's like mindless money machines because children's cartoons on YouTube are awful like YouTube kids do not show it to anyone there's a reason there's a thing called Elsa gate out there like sexualized children's content and that's an actual thing that like companies produce children watch rewatch rewatch because it's sexualized content they don't understand but it's like addressing some primal urges a lot of it has been being taken down uh, over the last years because they're cracking down on it but it's just they generate money a lot of money for the people and it's but you know like, what it's good we talk about those things at the moment because when you have your child i would like to see you both in one or two years time and what you're going to answer to those questions or how we're going to yeah. have a chat then because yeah. Really often you have your mindset ready, like I don't show this, I don't do this. There is a parent who is, they continue this and they really don't show where they really keep the eye on it. And also when people say, oh yeah, the YouTube, but oh, my child doesn't want to watch the Estonian language um, cartoons because they're boring. Yeah. And then the parents will come... overstimulating and flashy and they want yeah. the more dopamine, So colorful let's say. and yeah. like yes, there's a lot happening on the screen and it's just like, I have trouble like concentrating and like looking at those things i remember when i went to sin lab to give uh blood tests there was this uh, masha and the bear or something the cartoon playing on the tv the nurse was talking to me i was looking at the tv and i was like huh what are you saying huh yeah it's and like how do you expect out. your child then to to yeah. uh do anything with you or or have any exactly. reaction what you're talking but the, because you already know your own behavior as well yeah so it's it's in my head what I'm gonna do if and when it my, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to raise my child like 10 years without watching TV or knowing what TV is or how to turn it on but when uh, when they do start watching something when they do want to start watching cartoons 
is like I'm going to have a pre-vetted list of cartoons, like a small list that they can see. And they can rewatch them, they can watch them whatever times they want, but it's it's a Wrong. list of pre I things. will already cut into this. How come? You, first of all, put the time frame. How long? Half an hour? Yeah, no, 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 I mean, it's or like... It's it's like... It's uh, not they're going to watch this like 10 times in a day. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, they're going to sit there and you're like, Phew, do you want to watch one more time? Let's go for it. Oh, guys, no, we can, no, no, we can, not, not we can like continue. That. When I say a small list, I mean, like let's say 50 things that I pre-vetted. Because I don't trust most media. It's like it, there's agenda in every media. There's programming in every media. Mm-hmm. There's uh, so many things that you don't want to cause, like let's say, brain rot. Let's put it that way. So I'm gonna have like a small pre-filtered list that I've uh, researched, and I wonder if there's actually any resources out there that are like gonna avoid, like let's say, politically loaded cartoons from children or anything. Could be. There's also one thing that people should be aware of is the commercials that are being shown to the children during the programs right so i don't know if it's like i think on youtube as well i mean that's why you create these lists and everything that you control them that nothing gets in there without you knowing but that's if you start talking about those advertisements uh my point of view is uh children who've been watching screens having all the flashing uh flashing advertisements everything that's most of those children have the eating disorders they have issues Mm eating normally you see and more and more today we have like overweight generations we see the children because they've been growing up front of the they sitting in the buggy they're just few months old they already have the screen front of the front of them because they oh but that's a good one you can't sell me any idea why your baby needs a screen mm-hmm. you can't just have the conversation with me because i can tell you why it's not good you say oh but it's good for the brain Tell me what's wrong with the books and going out and have actually physical running around. Yeah, they're going to fall down. They're going to have a little bit of scratch on the leg or that's fine. But tell me one good reason. I've been using once the screen when we was uh, with the little ones. I had two little ones and our taxi didn't come. We have to go to the train station. We had a time. We was really limited with the time. I need them to help me. And this is like a weapon for me to use with them. I said, guys. You have to help me. We have to do it. You're going to have a screen time. You didn't know how much those children can actually do it. <laughs> you didn't know this three and five year old going to be amazing, carry all the big bags for the summer holiday to take a train. <laughs> so, and when we was uh, on the way back from Paris, they asked, do you want us to help? Can we have a screen? I said, no. And I carry happily the bags. So use it really, you know, there is something like what they really wanted. You had the emergency. Let's say you have two children. A rare treat. There is an accident, let's say, and you really need to concentrate on the child who actually going to have a surgery and stitches. I don't blame you if you put the screen for the other one to keep it calm and concentrate for the situation. Of course, don't leave the child, the one with the screen just wherever, but make mm-hmm. a decision when it's the time to use it and be agree both on the same page. It's not like one said, oh, that's fine. And then the child will be, but daddy said, I can have it. Mm. So make sure you have the same rules. You follow both. So I guess the general takeaway is we know how the screens affect adults and uh, we should then be extra careful with children just because of that. That's why I say it's really, it's, it's like a really thin ice you walk on it it's easy to just okay let's do it once and then you're actually gonna do once twice Mm -hmm. and you know how do you think though it relates to the um, obesity in children or like the the eating disorder if you look any look up any researchers there is so much information about this the children who is overweight is it because they move less or is it something like less all the advertisement, the crap what is advertised. Do you see any advertisement for the carrots and broccoli? <laughs> do you see not. the happy broccoli Have your on your plate? It's so amazing. Or do you see the advertisement uh, for the fizzy drinks? Some, some uh, food what is inside this um, beautiful, colorful uh, package. Mm-hmm. They've been trying to do for those veggies as well, five a day and all this stuff. Why they are not successful? 
It's not enough good marketing. If you don't like the broccoli, your child will not like either. They want also this crisps and uh, all kinds of ready-made meals. What is full of sugar stuff you don't even know what is inside there. Mm -hmm. I know you wanted to move on to baby massages, but before we do that, what is like, uh, is there anything else that's non-obvious that new parents might not think of when it comes to health and safety of children and raising babies? Yes, I think at home one things you can do if you have the blinders and you know on the side there is a little how you call it? you can oh, the just, plastic thing yeah, do, do roll the up plastic the plastic rope yeah do roll up the the blinder put those really safely high enough so the baby can't grab or put head inside they push the the chair there and children are really creative when they are small and they start especially they start climbing they start walking they put the head inside and we don't want to think what is next. You don't want to see the picture there. But if you do some research, uh, how dangerous are those blinders, especially the the blinders, the the rope or how... Mm -hmm. The ones you see yeah, on yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. There is a special holders you can uh, install on the side of the wall. the wall and just put them away. Make sure the child has no access on these ones mm. and the other thing is um, not be bags so this plastic bags tiny plastic bags where you can put the nappies don't leave anywhere around the house it's really easy when the babies start crawling around they're gonna just eat those so baby proofing is a serious business that you should pay attention to yes and if you have someone around to come to visit you you should mention you want to baby proof I don't know if you want to do the US way, because in US they are really, I think even top of everything, baby proofing, every single corner probably will be covered with a little um, help, foam, let's with say. a foam or the little um, corners. Yeah. With a that seems difference. a bit much. I think it? you have to use your common sense. Yeah. Mm. Cause some, yes, some places are really like easy to open and they can really hurt themselves yeah. but some are but like all your chemicals where is your chemicals yeah. home chemicals we don't have well, any yeah. <laughs> but so we I, do have we do have the eco-friendly ones and that's also not yeah yeah i recommend when you go home go down into your belly have a look what you can do this every, crawling around exercise. exactly <laughs> do this and you're gonna find so much stuff you're like all right, I think we have quite a lot to do before we have a baby. Because you think like, oh, I'm going to do this when I have the baby. Then you have no time. Mm. You have no time to do the things when you already have the baby. You have so much else to do. I recommend have the baby proofing the house before the baby comes. And one last thing, stopping on the health and safety that people don't uh, think about often. But we have talked about it in our materials here especially related to going down to your belly and chemicals is the house dust so why it, it's i'm going to insert this here myself it's like very important to keep your house free of dust especially if you have little ones crawling around because there was a study by the um, harvard and silent spring institute that was looking into uh, the average household dust so what they found is that in the average american household the dust in the average household contained 45 different chemicals from five different chemical classes. And these chemicals have been known carcinogens, hormone disruptors, and uh, anything else. So they've been known to cause, again, developmental issues, neurodevelopmental issues, uh, contribute to, in adults, Alzheimer's, cancers, attention deficit disorders, and everything else. So imagine babies who are crawling around and putting their hands in their mouths because this study mostly looked at how the dust affected babies and the outcomes were not pretty so keeping your house clean from dust and things that collect dust and dust that babies can put in their mouths is perfect now with this i'm not saying that you should keep your baby away from uh, all the germs and sanitize their hands exactly all the time. you don't want to yeah. raise a bubble child but the household dust that's filled with all the chemicals that you use in your household, including perfumes and cleaning products and everything that's going to end up all in the dust. This is something you definitely want to keep your child away from. So that's one point that I wanted to insert in here myself. So if you ask me what I will do when you have a child, don't be OCD. I will say this way. Mm. 
Be mindful when you choose your, your chemicals, whatever you use at home. Be mindful and don't get crazy because we see there is, it can be two ends. People who say, oh, that's fine, you know, baby gonna get used to with the germs. Mm -hmm. But there is also those who is OCD, they're gonna just wipe every single surface. It's so sterile. So when the baby or gonna grow bigger, they're gonna pick up everything. It's gonna be really actually health. It's not any more healthy when someone just going and wiping everything all the time. Yeah. Yeah, so th you should, that's the difference yes, there. You uh, should find a golden. Like. Yes, exactly. So, and I think that's the things like if you, if you talk about also which country, which chemicals, what is more like well known, because mm -hmm. depends of the country, some countries are more into this, like it's have to be super sterilized. It's have to be everything. Same time when other countries are more like light back, I think it's that really depends of the country and what they have in the market. In US probably the question is how many house products they sell there. Mm -hmm. That's a good marketing. And um, if you want to make out the good money, you will make like stuff for the house cleaning. And if you say this, product will be good for your baby and health and like everything it's gonna kill the germs people will go go wild yeah we talked uh, quite a bit at home also about like the um, oils for example like that you use on the babies and you know any kind of products that uh, that are for babies but they're actually toxic because they have perfumes they have fragrances in them um, some of them they have talk right um, which was the baby powder and they shouldn't be actually used on on the babies and we talked about the massage and uh, we touched on you know what oils should you actually use and you said none <laughs> as as much as possible just don't use any oil yes i think the baby skin it's really like you have the baby it's been not touched with any creams anything and as long as possible to keep this way if there is any skin conditions or, or there is always things to find out with a doctor go and have the test and don't just start rubbing some cream on your baby because someone said that's gonna be so good i would recommend always do the research what do you put on your baby skin or the food you give to your children mm -hmm. everyone i think the parents know what is the best for the children and i will always leave this to the parents until it doesn't harm them one of the incredible things that I discovered in the pharmacy is that the eczema creams actually have uh, petroleum in them, which is like, it blows my mind because it's like your skin is already sensitive and irritated. There is something going on uh, Why the eczema is actually out. And then when you have the remedy for it, it's full of chemicals. It's like, it just doesn't, um, doesn't, uh, doesn't make sense to me. But can well, I tell I you mean, something? The thing with eczema creams is because they're often uh, treated by corticosteroids. So you have like hydrocortisol or other things. In that sense, that they have this one ingredient that uh, helps to remove the eczema on the surface level. It doesn't matter what all the other ingredients are. It's just like a generic cream yeah. in that sense. So that's how that ends up to be. Mm -hmm. But I guess what you're saying is is you want to treat the eczema with something like that's actually treating the eczema let's say zinc creams and everything else but even the zinc zinc creams they have yeah. they have the petroleum yeah. in them but what are the other options then there are natural ones that you can buy but they're usually made by you know small producers local producers and how can you like what what should a person look out for who is trying to buy these things the ingredient list on it. It should not have anything else but natural oils, and then um, we can put the we can put links um, as well uh, in the description for the products that we found that actually like work and they are they're good and natural. I find mm -hmm. really often what comes up uh, when we talk about those products. So there is a marketing. Who does the bigger marketing? You get yeah. people to buy it. The second one is if it's more produced like in locally, the price goes up and lots of people, is it affordable? Mm -hmm. So I think there is uh, so many things what people gonna gonna look for it. And like your family members, they've been using that cream maybe 75 years and they're still alive and they will say, I don't see any issues. You find like, fine, let's do it. And it will be every product. It depends who recommend this to you. What is, is it affordable? 
and your own knowledge as well. I always say just do your own homework as much as possible and make your own decision. I can't come and make a decision to someone. So we've covered everything with health and safety and about baby first aid, but we touched on multiple times previously about massages and baby massages. So why is a baby massage necessary? What is a baby massage? Why do I have to do it? Because again, for me, I haven't been in this baby sphere before. So this is my first time hearing that I actually should be massaging my baby. So what's the concept and why do parents have to do it? And what are the benefits? One of the best benefits uh, during the baby massage, you're going to have the contact with your baby. You're going to learn about your baby body. You know when there is a gas, there is some problems with the digestion. You can see this really clearly when the baby's stomach is hard. So you're going to like actually feel this? Yes, you can feel because when the baby's stomach is really hard, you can feel there is actually issues with the digestion. You should do the massage and... uh, And the massage is going to help relieve this. Yes. No. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's not like just doing five minutes massage. Sometimes it can be taken an hour. What people will say, oh, no, but I have to do so long. But you're going to do as long as it takes to, to make the things move. And you learn every time you do the massage for your child, you learn how to how how the baby's body react reacts. to your touch. Right. Yeah. Yes. And also when after being so long in your into your belly, and coming out to the world, you want the baby have a good stretches. You want to have the good sleep. Baby body going to take more oxygen. You're going to have, there is so many benefits for the baby massage. And I don't talk about the baby massage doing something with their fingertips. I'm talking about the proper massage, what lots of people or lots of countries that will go to the physiotherapy. Oh, I don't recommend to learn this from the YouTube because yeah, uh, I, I would guess a lot of people you can hear ENA, this. You can end up on the yeah. ENA. Like, I don't think you want to go to the... Because some people might hear this on this podcast and think, okay, I'm going to learn how to do a baby massage now. Go on YouTube, type in baby massages, watch a video and then start performing it. You have a lots of videos. You have a lots of things in the internet. My recommendation will have face to face someone who gonna see what is your position on their hands. Like we find out today, for you, you are not flexible enough to do this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can't. Uh, some my of hands the things, <laughs> yeah. like I ask you to do, you feel like okay, that goes to the side of the yoga class. That's not my yeah, area. That, that's her area. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm gonna be doing. So you're gonna find out. Actually, it, it's not that easy. And nobody didn't say it's uh, it's have to be easy. So the baby massage, you will find out like if there is any like uh, muscle tension, you should you should work on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can help the child when they start standing. The one things I go a lots of people have now, and they feel proud of themselves. Oh, are my baby standing on the tippy toes? It's so nice. They start like doing a little ballerina. I see this, and I'm like, you have to deal with this because. Your baby start walking and the first things they do, they're going to f- fall down on the face and the face can really damage because all the body weight is on the chest, not on the bottom. So there is a lot of exercise how to help to get mm-hmm. the muscles really strong and make and sure it's, it's going to be like... So those are the, the baby squats. Yeah, yes, exactly. That's so the I baby thought, squats, yes. What I've heard is that when you see your child like going on their on their toes, you should just push their heels down. But you told me that there it's is not the problem. It's not the, yeah, it's, exactly. It's you have to have the good exercise, do the massage, and you can help swimming. It's one of the really amazing mm-hmm. exercise for the for everyone. Or doing like the baby squats. Yes, basically because yes. you said that the reason why they are standing up on their tippy toes is that their um, their muscles are not strong enough basically yes the, the muscles on the bottom it's not strong enough yeah. and what's happened they're gonna all the body weight goes on the chest they're gonna let the hands off from the sofa and the first experience why they they, they should start like little doing little steps they're gonna smash their face and it can delay the confidence to start walking when do you start with all of these like exercises and massages and everything from, from day, day one. one right yeah <laughs> yeah because what was surprising for me as well i saw this video on uh, tiktok or instagram i think where there were parents uh, lifting their baby up to a bar and letting the baby just hang and they were of course supporting the baby and there was like a time lapse it's like uh, one week one month three months, one year, two year. And I was asking you about this uh, 
completely ready that you're going to scold me that that's a dumb idea you shouldn't do any of this but you actually supported the idea it's like hey it's good any kind of exercise is good and it's like fine to do it's good for the upper body i don't see anything there is no any harm yeah. in the world like there is there is no reason did you see the baby is screaming or crying no. or the there is nothing so there was actually good great activity for the for the child but always health and safety yeah every time you do something you should make sure it's the health and safety. Uh, I know the US people are really into this health and safety with the babies and I'm, I'm the same. I'm in the same boat with them. It's just surprising to me that uh, I, I, in my head, I thought babies are very, very delicate and doing all these squats and things and hangings is like too much and it shouldn't and you should just like leave them alone and let them grow. But now actually like hearing this and seeing this that you should get involved. You should help your baby exercise and all these things. I mean, obviously, because I exercise and and it helps us. Why wouldn't it help a baby? But having yeah. this frame then like made black and white and just, like served to me on a silver platter, like, hey, this is how you should do it. It's just like valuable. And now now I know. The only like, thing you can do change. so much stuff with your children. I, f- yeah. I find like when people say, oh, the, the first few months you have a baby, nothing to do. Dad, just sit back and relax. That's the baby gym now. Yes, but you can do so much stuff and helping with that, doing a baby massage, it's also helps the digestion. It's it's easier for you to feel the baby body and you know how many burps after the feed or between the feeds the baby should do. You know, like if the baby needs more massage on the legs, because when they grow, they start having sometimes those pain on the legs and you know, it's not they're going to, the baby's children will come and say, oh, I have a pain. It is growing sport. And the pain mm-hmm. is because they grow and the muscles sometimes doesn't, the body and um, and the muscles doesn't grow in the same time and they need some help for the muscles and stuff. So I will take seriously when the child comes and say, I have actually pain on my legs. Mm-hmm. I don't ignore this. And mm-hmm. a friend of ours is actually learning baby osteopathy. Do you have any opinions on that? Taking a baby to an osteopath to get like professionally massaged every once in a while. In UK, it's a really popular things to go. The first things to see the baby's head size and all this kind of, they do a little bit different than physiotherapy. So osteopa, it's something I'm not someone to talk about because mm. I have no idea, knowledge about the, but I know if people like worried about the head and things, so they go there and they Supposedly will be Supposedly it was like helping with growing pains and everything as well. So yes, if. If that's the one, just uh, do your research of who you actually go to, who you go yeah. to see firstly. Yes, right? because and today then... when we met, my we start happily to do the things and then <laughs> I ask, um, but how did you let me to come to, into your house, teach you the baby massage, talk about the breastfeeding and first aid? Did you ask me any qualifications? And you're both like... You look at me like had a slap with a slipper <laughs> on your face, like, uh, uh, no, but I read on the internet. Did you ask any qualifications before you go anywhere? Anyone mm-hmm. ask, do they have a qualification? You want to have someone to help you with your baby and the care. Don't just go someone who, I don't know, going to drink a bleach and say, that's the best things to do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There could yeah. be people out there who say that. So yeah. exactly. So yeah. that's do your homework yeah. and find out where you go and who do you yeah. ask you help. Even in the case of like you were recommended uh, to us by by our doula, um, who has also like a wonderful um, folder with uh, with certifications. Um, so I just didn't think about it. But yeah, you uh-huh. have a you have a really good point. No excuses. No excuses. No excuses. Exactly. You never know. Yeah. Maybe I, I find oh I have someone just on my family. I want to support the business, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. But going back to the massages, there was one thing that I was almost like embarrassed uh today when you asked me, it's like do you know what colic is? And I thought I did. I thought that I always thought that it has something to do with the digestive system of the baby, that they have gas or, you know, something's wrong with the digestion. But you actually corrected me that it's a, it's technically a um, um, diagnosis when they don't know what is what wrong is the with diagnose? the baby, what the, what the diagnosis is. So it's a non-diagnosis. It's a non-diagnosis for basically a baby crying for a couple of hours, right? Yes, and that's have to be like several days in the one 
like in a row when the baby three four hours or longer will cry and you can't find out what is the reason really often that will lead to the some it can be just a gas but it can be also the some allergic reaction or intolerance on the milk what the baby just can't digest and the baby can't tell you what's wrong Mm -hmm. if you breastfeed your child and you say your baby's crying my first things i will ask you to send me the list of the food you've been eating and i'm gonna tell you what is the most common food to make the gas and what to avoid if you tell me you breastfeed and your baby's crying hours every evening and when i see your list of the food you have there like chocolate you have some sweets well, and you mean i'm not gonna be able to eat chocolate yes no so enjoy what you have now and that's it finished Uh-oh. no it's it's the question is the quantity because you okay. want your uh, energy level to go up quickly so you're gonna eat a lot of mm-hmm. sweets what actually the baby carbohydrates gonna, basically like the yeah. baby gonna get everything all the sugar what it, what can goes lots of gas mm-hmm. and that's can really not helpful for the digestion so i will recommend to do some changes on the food menu so i'm, I'm gonna help frame this for the uh, viewer and the listener as well depending on which platform you're on so colic in essence uh, colic without this h-c-o-l-i-c colic is a, di- a non-diagnosis for babies who are like fussy babies and they're crying and when we don't know why they're crying we call them colic almost as if it's a reason but just as is let's say cancer or multiple sclerosis there is no one cancer there is no one multiple sclerosis there's multiple roads that lead to the same thing so for each of these diseases or like let's say diagnosis to manifest you need underlying mechanisms or underlying reasons like failing mechanisms or underlying reasons that lead to these things and that comes together in terms of colic there's always a reason why baby is colic your job is then to find out the reason and then take care of the reason there is not just like a fussy baby if the baby is crying if there's something wrong with the baby the baby is in need of something or is uncomfortable in some way but there's just like not a colic baby oh that baby is just colic there's nothing else wrong with it yes i will say that uh, that the word colic it's easy to just uh, give the reason if you are the parent you call to your doctor and say oh yeah my baby's crying oh that's a colic Mm -hmm. and you put the phone away okay that's colic that's fine but did you actually find out what is the reason the baby's crying did you work on this like if there is any any reason maybe it's just the over tiredness you just didn't know the to find out if your baby gonna be just over stimulated too much screen time uh if you have to find out what is the reason and there is sometimes they can't just say what what's wrong with the baby or Mm -hmm. what is the what is what what is the reason and that's that's like you you did your you take out your phone to find out what is colic i said it's just babies crying undiagnosed that there is no diagnose why the baby is crying okay and we're coming up on time here but before we finish let's quickly stop on also breastfeeding and there's a great transition here from colic is that what you mentioned that one of the reasons or one of potential reasons that could lead to a baby being colic is also the mother's diet for example the mother is eating something let's say eggs or what was the example that you brought dairy dairy a lot dairy of, products, a lot of it yeah. was like dairy products that you can pass yeah. that you can pass through to the baby and the baby is actually allergic and then reacting to the mother's diet so uh, this is one a- additional example to colic you can touch on this if there's something more to add there but otherwise um take it away i'm not an expert in breastfeeding and i was on my phone most of the time so i'm gonna yes that's what i want to say and that was the one thing you've been on the screen how much attention you put on the breastfeeding part you didn't because you think there is nothing to do you have no part on this but you have lots Breast of massages. things in. that's that's when you put your phone away actually <laughs> 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 yeah that was it the thing, my interest like, that was picking your interest and you actually put your phone and you came up like okay so what <laughs> tell me tell what's I, going when, on here is it is it now what I'm are like, we talking yeah. about <laughs> <laughs> no not now not now so yeah it's it, it's a lot to do with um with the diet what the mom's eating and drinking what i say really often i come across with a new mom who don't eat or drink enough 
Mm-hmm. That's why you suggested to have like bottles around the I house. I recommend like to have to the, just... the little bottles of water everywhere. Wherever you sit to do the breastfeed, you can grab the bottle. You can just refill it and you have the and little like like fruits or nuts or whatever handful it so you can just get some uh, extra mm-hmm. energy from the this kind of quick food but don't have like some chocolates or sweets hmm. to this point i recommend if you if you like potatoes have just even boiled potato in your hand it's really good just to keep your energy level and it's uh, healthier to having when you have the some sweets or or any kinds of uh, food from the package, what is yeah. nice and shiny. The chocolate is going to be a hard one. So I'm giving it up. In terms of breastfeeding, then, what are the some quick fire do's and don'ts for new mothers, new fathers? Uh, what should we be aware of when it comes to breastfeeding? First thing, it's uh, it's not easy for everyone. And my first recommend first recommendation for the new parents, find a really good breastfeeding supporter. Find someone who knows what do you like to do. Explain what do you want. Ask like a lots of questions. Like we went through a lots of questions today. And if I start talking about, yes, you can have a flat nipples and all kinds of things, what can actually affect your your breastfeeding journey. Yeah, like I wouldn't know that without without talking to you. Like there's actually like a little pump that can help your nipple to like come out so that the baby can actually latch on it properly. Yes. And uh, what is actually like different, like nipple seals and Mm -hmm. all this kind, all all, whatever you need, like there is so much to cover. Find a really good breastfeeding supporter, make, be a friend before you have a baby and make sure you're on the same let's say uh, you have same view and how and you want to do page. and also mm. someone who doesn't charge you like if you say okay this breastfeeding journey it doesn't work I can't do mentally physically there is whatever reasons and this person should be nice and kind to you support your journey to the bottle feed or formula feed the baby because the main things baby should be fed but why people stop doing the breastfeeding is because they don't have enough support. So it's not about not having enough milk. It's about it's not a having support. Enough, it's I, a support. I will say the number one thing is have the support, meet up, see the person, go through all kinds of things, ask lots of questions. Like today I came, like have all kinds of uh, breast bumps and <laughs> all kinds of things when you're like, oh, what is this and what is that? Um, yeah. so there is so much to cover so find a really good support yeah and then the rest of it if you have this it's possible to do it and the good news is you have just a one child but can you imagine if you had triplets <laughs> nope and i also know the the one thing that really um that i was impressed with was that you actually helped a mom who was already um formula feeding the baby for a month or two and you helped her to actually start breastfeeding again. So there are ways that you can even do that and you can support the mom to do that if you have the right support, if the support is right. Yes, um, so, so and, there is there is yeah. the way you can do uh, when, when you want to, you start the breastfeeding and then you decide it's not for me and then you decided sometimes later, no, actually I want to do it. There is a ways you can get your milk production to work. There is a remedies to help you find the right person to support, do your researches and you can do it. That's amazing because I would ne- I would have never thought that that's something pos- that's possible. Yes. At all. Yeah. How come? So you can, I don't know, because it's like once you stop producing milk, it's like, I thought it would be like difficult to do it again if you stop. And coming full circle here, as you were showing Miriam all these uh, breast uh, pumps and milk breast devices and everything, I don't even know how to name these things. Uh, the whole floor is filled with them. I guess it also comes back to what you mentioned there, because I did listen to something, some things, uh, is that you really have to wait till the baby arrives. And we touched on this before, before you start purchasing all these things to test if they, they work for you. So not overbuy a bunch of expensive things, 
and just have them sit around or maybe not, not even work for you. So you really have to wait till you're breastfeeding to find the right fit, find the right sizes and find the right devices. Yes. That they actually can work with. You, you really have to. I, I will say just wait, have the baby first and then have a look. What is your needs? Mm-hmm. What do you need? Which kind of device you need? Do you need just to get more breast milk or you already have like overproducing milk? That's also one of the things like people don't think that's possible. It is possible. And how to deal with this situation. Mm-hmm. But everything goes back to find the, find the good support. With every single things, find also the people who do the same things around you. Like hang out with the moms who who do the breastfeeding. They can give a good tips. One of the good things you want to do the breastfeeding, have the bee cabbage and the fridge. <laughs> yeah. It will help you a lot. So I think the one thing is just lower your expectations for the breastfeeding as well. And I will say first four to six weeks, just concentrate for the breastfeeding. Don't do anything else. Just take the time to make sure your number one is not to, to watch new series, what came out on some of the Netflix. You can catch up later. Yeah. You can, yeah, can you believe you can catch up later? But uh, also just concentrate what is important. Make the priority. Mm-hmm. Really often everyone wants to do the multitasking. You can do watch your lovely serial when you do the breastfeeding but first you have to establish your breastfeeding journey. Mm. Don't you in day one, like put the movie on and then like, oh, why this doesn't work. And then you find out, oh, your baby wasn't actually having a breast. It was just on the side, sucking a little, um, yeah. side poop. Yes, and, and exactly. the movie was disturbing and yeah. it was, uh, you know, yeah. screwing and you up mentally. So yes. to finish up, wrapping everything up in a neat package, very quick fire. First things, if they come to your mind, what are some of the products a new parent should get before the baby arrives? What what are the essentials that you need to have ready? I don't have uh, anything special to bring it out to. Oh, that's the item. It's going to save your lives or any anything. I don't have any of those recommendations for the things, but I have a really good recommendation. Lower your expectations. Like extremely lower your expectations and when things go really well you're gonna be whoo that wasn't that hard and why because you lower your expectations before you had your baby why people feel they they are not good parents because their expectations are so high and unrealistic do you have three or five people to help you every day with everything in the house no so then you can't have this kind of instagram lifestyle (laughs) And on that note, uh, if the people watching and listening want to uh, learn more about what you're doing, want to find some resources, where can they find you? Where should they go? You can find me on Instagram, uh, Kaidi and Babies. You can uh, find in the home page, it's uh, www.kaidiandbabies.com. I do a little bit of blog. I share a little bit of my experience, what I do with the babies and families and how I feel about not too much because I'm really busy with the children. So I don't have much time for the screen, but I am there. And uh, if someone wants to find me, you can find me. Okay. We'll Perfect. put all the links down as well. Yes, we're going to share the links in the show notes. And I think it's been an amazing day. There's it's a, been a long day. lot to digest. Yes. <laughs> to decompress, be honest. A lot decompress. of decompress. So did you lower yeah. your expectations, guys? <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's a process. It's a process. Yeah. 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 But I think that uh, it's, it's really helpful to, to be able to talk to you and to be, you know, to have the privilege of like having you come over to our home and showing us all the stuff. Cause yeah, like you said, like I was like, what the heck is all this? And it's going to make it, it, it's making it easier. It, it makes me even feel better about my own journey of like not being as prepared as some of my friends who already have like everything bought in like 10 pieces of each and and stuff like that and I'm like oh I don't know I haven't looked into it yet or it's like I'm waiting with that so I think that's uh that was definitely like really helpful thank you so much for uh for the day for showing us everything teaching us all the things we need to know and thank you for the time in this podcast it's been a pleasure and to everyone else Bye. Thank Thank you. you.